maybe uh, one or two more, one minute maybe. Hey, Eugenio, great Hello, to see you. Hello, everyone. Great, great to, see, to see you. Great to see you. I also see you, Alfonso. Nice to see you back. Hi. Hi, everyone. So anyway, uh, we will start in a moment. You know, first thing is uh, we have to talk about the policies of the Linux Foundation. There are main, <laughs> two main policies. One is the fact that you know, we are bound by the antitrust policy of wherever you're logging in from. So please keep that in mind. Uh, second, is we are committed to diversity, inclusion, and being basically allowing people to speak. And even if you do not disagree with people, please do not be nasty in short. <laughs> so these are the only two things that govern this is a completely open call. There are, uh, there's the main event is Mike uh, proposing a uh, DeFi uh, subgroup for now. Um, so let me lead off with one thing, which is uh, several people have suggested to me that the name of the group is uh, not appropriate at the moment because it is no longer dealing just with capital markets, but with all and you know all things that have to do with finance, including payments. Mm -hmm. And as we know, that uh, the um, first use case for blockchain is in the payment space, so that's definitely part of our. Um, part of our remit because uh, no capital markets uh, system will exist without a payment rail. And obviously the speed and the assurance of the payment rails control other features like liquidity, like, you know, uh, the pace at which the market proceeds uh, settles, custodies, everything is uh, sort of grist to the mill. The other part that we haven't uh, talked about is the, uh, is the fact that we also deal in short-term debt. Capital markets are normally for long-term. Mm -hmm. So the uh, suggestion is to name this as a finance special interest group that would encompass everything, including infrastructure, uh, because uh, you know if you name it finance and financial markets and infrastructure, then it becomes a little too big the name to make sense. So finance was the suggestion and I'm writing up a short rationale for changing the name what are the implications of the ch name change? It means that all our uh, resources that are, con that are currently under CM-SIG will um, go to F-SIG. And uh, I don't know what to do about the, you know, the references that we have all over the place for that. And I'm, you know, I would like to hear, uh, responses from people about this because we do focus a lot on uh, CBDCs, for example, which is currently, uh, uh, you know, in, in in the news. Of course, the other, other thing that's in the news is 
what's happening to DeFi, especially stable coins. Uh, there's been a lot of press about it, but we had noted uh, before some of the problems with uh, algorithmic stable coins um, and even with regular stable coins because stable coin is just a marketing term in a sense. Um, sometimes they are not stable nor coins, but you know the point is that it, this is uh, like all marketing terms, when reality uh, meets the solution, then reality triumphs all the time. Um, so for people who are complaining that this was an attack by uh, some particular parties and so on, you know, I think uh, if your solution cannot withstand the rigors of uh, the, the real world, which in this case uh, do not even have regulation. Uh, anyway, enough about stable coins. Maybe we'll have a, another session on that later, maybe in Mike's subgroup. So before we uh, start, I want to introduce Mike McCoy, who was the uh, chair of the Hyperledger Healthcare Group. As part of Humana, he, he has developed uh, solutions there, but now he has moved into the new economy, into uh, Block Demon, which used to be an infrastructure uh, provider, but now I think they are getting into uh, DeFi. So Mike, uh, I think you should take it away. Uh, and uh, talk about your subgroup, what your aims are, and how we can help, how we can collaborate, um, especially with a lab project or something like that. So uh, I'm going to mute myself. And... All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right, I'm gonna to try to start. My computer's just doing a little slowness right now, but uh, give me a moment. I should be able to present. Um, awesome. So now I just wanna. <laughs> All right. All right, let me know if you can see this as well. We'll take a hot second. More than a New York minute. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, cool. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike McCoy. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Uh, for the past two years, actually, as Vipin mentioned, I was running the healthcare special interest group. I was working at Humana and more so from about uh, 2018, 2019 till 2021. I was solely focused on everything healthcare blockchain, healthcare life science blockchain. And I was able to build a lot of different uh, projects, including uh, running this uh, project with the Synaptic Health Alliance that helped uh, enable better reconciliation of payments and claims within mm -hmm. health insurance claims uh, called Provider Data Exchange. And prior to that, I worked at Accenture and Consensus in uh, a whole lot of different uh, use cases, uh, not only within healthcare, but mostly in financial and, and, um, and other type of use cases as well. So. Uh, I, I went from going fully decentralized protocols from 16, 17, 18, to then working on permissioned blockchains from 19, 20, 21, and now working at Block Daemon and doing a combo of, we are a staking and node infrastructure provider. So if you are a large institution or a bank and you want to be able to stake at scale, we provide solutions there. Uh, but we're also adding in DeFi components and other methods with your reward or your staking rewards and being able to use that in DeFi pools into a lot of other things. But I want to present because I talked to Karen Otani, who's also uh, the ecosystem lead at uh, here at Hyperledger. And she believed that though uh, my focus is more into DeFi and more into financial use cases, that this group could kind of benefit from some of my DeFi work as well. So um, just gonna give like high overview, but I'll talk about how I like to present a DeFi subgroup 
if uh, this group believes that would be of value to everyone. So it's no secret recently that like DeFi and stable coins, algorithmic, algorithmic stable coins have really gotten a lot of pressure. We know about the Terra and Luna crash that when you know a market maker could be able to create a death spiral within that community, uh, it just went down and went into trouble. There are hacks within DeFi communities and open source working groups such as Axie Infinity into bridges such as Wormhole and into other DeFi protocol governance protocols such as Beanstalk and others. And this just happened within the past couple of months, right? But though there is a lot of hacks and, and though there are a lot of attempts to be able to control these type of fully decentralized networks, there are still a lot of people that are, are getting into this space. And so with all these uh, potential uh, you know, errors in these spaces, I think there's only room to really go up. And there's a, a high level of education and a high level of, uh, of technical definitions that need to be put into this place into the space to really make sense for everyone and everyday people to get a hold of it. And so the DeFi ecosystem is quite large. There are, uh, there are a ton of players in the space. It goes, it goes from everywhere between uh, exchanges and liquidity, derivatives, credit and lending, uh, actual payments. There are some uh, marketplaces on here and then there's a bunch of asset management. But what really is coming into play that I'm seeing in everyday conversations with clients that I'm interacting with is how we're getting real world securities, real world mortgages, real world assets into crypto native protocols to be able to earn rewards, as well as to be able to uh, stake those assets and be able to connect them to the full decentralized web. And uh, so this space is only growing as, uh, as you can see here. Now, DeFi is not that old, and it, it really only came into play probably around 2019, where most people were actually familiar with it. Since those days of 2019, uh, or even 2020, where there was real growth, you could actually see that it went from zero to $100 billion in just two years. At its peak, it was somewhere around uh, $275 billion in value as well. Some could say it's a bubble, some could say it's a pop, but there's clearly a lot of real world revenue that is actually going into this space and it's still quite young. It already has a large chunk of financial wealth. If you look at other banks that are in the world today, if DeFi were to represent uh, the largest US bank, it would be 31st in uh, total assets under management. And this is from DeFi Llama that uh, is a website that is able to connect and, and curate all this information. So it, though it is, it, I think it's early right now. And one of my main points I'm trying to make today is that we are early and we are probably in like the early adopter stage and it's only going to grow and get better. And with that needing to get better, we need to be able to have better education through communities and open source communities like the Hyperledger one to be able to make it more meaningful. Now, institutions would think, okay, well, that's just going to, well, they're going to stay away from it. It's a little bit more of an error. We want to you know, be able to put our money into safer assets, uh, especially when you know, stock markets are crashing, crypto is crashing, et cetera. But this past week, when we saw a dip in Luna and Terra, we actually saw more institutions put money into crypto assets uh, than they have all year long. And yes, a lot of that is because of the dip. And a lot of that is because, hey, it's a cheap asset. Why not just buy it up while it's cheap? But I think that just goes to show that people aren't just fleeing away from crypto. They're looking for the next bull run to come around. And DeFi isn't just an internet casino. And I think like a lot of times in previous presentations within this SIG and others, we've mostly, uh, you mostly have talked about DeFi for pr fraud prevention or risk management and things like that. But DeFi can be able to do so much more than that. It can be able to actually improve operational costs, improve margin costs, improve overall spend, and actually get more bang for your buck when it comes to people, technical debt, technical infrastructure, et cetera. And so it's a real, it's a real opportunity for banks to be able to take away some of their technical debt and be able to really expand profits using these protocols in the right way. And today, like, TradFi is actually starting to use and utilize crypto products and projects. And uh, some of these are, some of these are functional, but a lot of them are in proof of concept and, and pilot stages. 
but uh, you can see that uh, crypto back lending is, is pretty popular. Uh, you can see that uh, facilitating AM client exposure to crypto is, is, is gaining traction as well as institutional crypto derivative trading for option vaults and futures. Uh, those ones are absolutely growing across the board. And all these banks, all these traditional financial institutions really want to learn more about it. And so, whoa, shit. That scared the hell out of me, that, that sneeze. But um, sorry about that. Anyway, uh, there's more legitimacy coming in the space is what I'm trying to say here. And it can only go up. Now, before the Luna crash numbers, all, all these numbers that are DeFi based were looking pretty good uh, when you compare uh, year over year. And so, you know, if that crash were to happen, who knows, right? Like markets go up and down constantly, but these numbers are, are quite expansive and can really help someone, uh, help a fund, help a family office, help a, a market maker, a liquidity provider, uh, really get some benefit from these natively DeFi and decentralized protocols. But it's also very important to learn what is actually under the hood of these things. See for Terra, right? They had negative equity that you would burn Luna to then uh, solidify UST. And a lot of that was, you know, just, and people were saving their money up in an anchor in the savings protocol that would give you 20% yield year over year. And that's just not sustainable, right? Uh, some of these other, uh, DeFi protocols or DeFi communities probably have a lot more, um, a lot more collateral to be able to actually back what is uh, funding their ecosystems or what are uh, generating yields in their networks. And I think it's very important to learn the lessons from issues and negative scenarios like Terra and how these other ones are, are truly growing uh, in the space today and compared to traditional markets and how we're doing that as well. And so DeFi and crypto are moving towards legitimacy. Uh, right now, uh, this past week, Compound, for example, uh, received an S&P credit rating. It's a B minus, and so it's an iffy grade, but they're trying to get regulation and they're trying to be very forward thinking in, in how everyday markets could be able to evaluate them from an investment standpoint. Uh, crypto also is getting more regulatory focus from Janet Yellen and, and, her, and her groups and being able to have uh, more crypto staffs, not for enforcement, but for understanding and educational purposes. And even NASDAQ is put, posting out uh, articles left and right about how lenders, borrowers, and traders will be using DeFi to be able to challenge primitive systems. And I, I really just think education in this space and bringing communities together like the Hyperledger community and understanding how and why this is building could be really valuable. So I also wanted to potentially go into more details on uh, stable coins, as they've mentioned. Uh, there's obviously fiat-backed stable coins, there's crypto-backed ones, and there's algorithmic ones. I think uh, we learned a little bunch of lessons on algorithmic stable coins and, and how you can be able to actually uh, create supply and demand. And, and this is still like a very forward thinking, may not even really be uh, a method people will utilize in the future due to examples of uh, Terra, but always truly an experiment moving forward. So the long story short of it is, uh, this is how I kind of want to run or would propose running a DeFi subgroup. Uh, when I was with the Hyperledger Healthcare Special Interest Group, we had um, just sections in our overall wiki that showed upcoming events so that people could be able to attend. We also had industry news research and, and group action items that people could join into, as well as a lot of educational material on like what crypto was, what blockchain was, how it affects everyone in healthcare and life science and things like that. I would just every two weeks be able to create a very similar like recap of everything that went on. We'd go through the news, we'd go through the research together as a group, uh, talk it out and, and kind of you know, go back and forth and understand what is hype, what is real and uh, be able to then educate others that may be a little bit new to the space on, on how this technology can work. So. Uh, that's really just what my proposal is, is being able to have an educational based understanding group. Uh, maybe we create, I'm not saying we're creating an actual protocol, we're actually create um, any type of tools within the subgroup as of today. I think at first we want to make it more educational. And then if we do see a need in industry for this or that, and there are open source contributors that have the time and the bandwidth to be able to make this happen, that's great. But I want to bring in like industry leaders at, at other funds, at other banks, at other um, 
uh, institutions around the world to come together and just educate each other on what is actually hype and what is real. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, hope this is informative. Uh, hope that you see that there is a lot of potential in the DeFi ecosystem to generate real wealth. And I don't think of DeFi as just a short-term play. Uh, I know a lot of people think it's just like a pump and dump scheme and, and maybe you know, beneficial to get short-term gains while markets are high or low. But I see a lot of people in groups in my world, at least today, that want to be able to use DeFi in the long term. Uh, so yeah, that is my presentation and uh, we'd love to hear any feedback. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, I think uh, if you have any questions, now is the time to bring it up. Questions or comments? Hey, Mike. it's it's myself. It's it's Eugenio. Uh, I, I I just wanted to to really thank uh, Mike for the presentation and uh, and share a couple of comments, uh, especially about the proposal. I firstly I I believe that DeFi space uh, it's actually uh, representing a value. Uh, in terms of uh, having a play of a uh, different game for uh, from institutional perspective so uh, i really believe that in our in our community as a expression of the capital market or the finance industry we need to uh, have a voice on that we need to start to, to have a voice on that and uh, starting on the educational side may be the right approach definitely because i mean for just uh, using myself as an example, I'm currently researching and studying on DeFi daily uh, for work, but also for, as a passion. Um, I am, for instance, more focusing on DAO initiatives, but that's as for myself. So I can only be more than welcome of this uh, initiative and uh, I will support on my side. Any other comments? Um, I do see uh, Sandy asking uh, whether it makes sense to call it financial services. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll address that in a minute, but let's talk about Mike's proposal first. Yeah, hey, mind. hey, Weapon, yes. Now I just want to uh, put that in the comments. Uh, uh, you know, I, I've actually attended Mike uh, from the, uh, the healthcare seg. I've attended a few of your sessions. Those were very informative. So uh, definitely welcome to see this here. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think I think it makes a lot of sense to have this subgroup and uh, have a lot of information sharing. And I'm sorry I'm not on video today. I just uh, taking the call from my Vox PC. Uh, so, but uh, yes, I definitely think we can add a bunch of uh, uh, like industry stuff going on here. Like like you started the session with the whole, you know, with the whole. Um, you know, with the whole tower thing, we can definitely go maybe in a little more depth in that as to exactly, uh, you know, like like Vipin was alluding to earlier, it was not only a little, uh, like not only the attack thing, obviously any, like just like we do in financial services, anytime we're working on any banking application, anything, it's paramount that it has to be able to withstand any uh, cyber attacks and any ransomware attacks. So same should have applied here in case of terror. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, something we can de maybe dig a little more into. Also more into regular, uh, regulatory side of things. I think that'd be pretty helpful today. Uh, so I basically, in short, I, I, I'm looking forward to, uh, to collaborate in this uh, group today. Thank you. Um, this is Guang Zhao, I'm from Clydo. Hey, Mike, um, I saw that you used to work with Consensus. Uh, by the time you left, I went to consensus, so we uh, didn't see uh, overlap each other, but a great uh, presentation today. Uh, I agree with what was said. I think there's a great values of, at least to continue the dis discussion of DeFi in the open source community. Uh, in terms of name, uh, I came across a few. Um, I don't have any recommendation, but just um, to be on the list, uh, DeFi is one of them, regulated DeFi, <laughs> is another one I came across. And the FinTech is FinTech. So that's all from me. Thank you, Mike and everyone. Hey, Mike, this is Marvin Van Tugen. Uh, great presentation. 
Um, you're following the path that we followed just several months ago. I'm from the mortgage subgroup, and a lot of the things that you're going through and, and talking about is, is what we went through, and we got a lot of support from Dip and, and the Hyperledger team. So definitely welcome you, and, and I'll reach out to you because I, I think there is quite a bit of overlap in terms of areas where we can collaborate. I can walk you through some of the POCs that we've done, some of the education that we've done, we have a monthly meeting and I'd welcome you to, to join the next monthly meeting and tell our group what you're doing. And, and uh, definitely, I, I think what you're advocating, uh, I do support, so welcome. Anybody I else? Think, uh, yes. Um, thank you, Mike, for the presentation. It was very good. Um, and I agree with uh, Eugenio and uh, with Marvin also. Um, I think the uh, adding the regulatory aspect would be important. I agree that education is, is the basis, but uh, the framework of regulations where we work. So I'm ready to help. Thank you. Anybody else? So Mike, this is Dan Schwartz. Just a question. And so I agree with everyone else that it was a very informative presentation and thank you for that. Um, organization of the information is hard. Um, but I just wonder why the intent for the subgroup is only informational in nature and why there isn't a reach for uh, establishing some shared protocols or common in, modes of interaction. Um, for, for DeFi to really realize its potential, it seems that interaction, it, you know, interaction is critical. Um, and, and so just wondering why you're, you know, not taking that as part of your charter. Yeah, I would say just in the interim uh, that what, uh, a lot of people that are part of hyperledger based communities know about DeFi, but they may not know the actual intricacies of it. I'm not saying the interaction of building and like getting hands dirty into software into code would not be part of the group. Uh, I just think the initial focus would be education. Then if we see, if we keep seeing trends that are coming from either research coming from developments uh, of actually building product, uh, are, are notified and like, so what we did also within the healthcare SIG is eventually we got to a point where every month, maybe every quarter, we went in like use cases and we settled on about eight to 10 different use cases that were actually being built in the healthcare life science industry. And so I showed on slide uh, two or three, I believe right here um, that, uh, give me a sec that there are categories here today, right? But as these evolve, they may become like stable coins may be less important in the future. They may even be more important. Like uh, I think just being able to really identify these and, and have our group a little bit more aware of them as time goes on could be more vital for general understanding. I'm not saying that there wouldn't be any technical build or protocols that could be built within the subgroup to make it more useful for us. Uh, I, I just say that wouldn't be the initial focus probably in the first two months. Thank you. Yeah, and it's really up to what the community decides too. If we believe like, hey, let's get down and dirty and let's like, let's bring in a hyperledger based protocol. I'm all for it, but uh, yeah. Anyone else? Mike, hey. I lost the slide. Can you make the larger so I can take a look? Sorry, sorry for the interruption. Sure. I'll uh, I can put it back on. You see it? Yeah. Ho hopefully we can share these slides, but uh, before we uh, do that, we'll have uh, some comments on that too, from me anyway. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll share this with you at the end, Vipin, to, to share to the rest of the group. Um, we did have another comment, I believe, from someone else. You have... Uh, any, any more comments? And so that I can start my, uh, my comments. Hey, Vipin, uh, yeah. uh, just one more thing to uh, add in there. Uh, Mike, probably this is something I can also reach out to you, uh, to you and Vipin. Uh, I'm looking at specifically about the 
the enterprise architectural uh, uh, paradigm uh, between TradeFi and and then DeFi. Uh, in fact, I'm supposed to be uh, having a presentation by myself for that. So there's something I'd like to work with you guys on. Uh, so I have some thoughts in my in my head and uh, in my head, and uh, I want to run them by you and see how we can present that. Uh, like especially in terms of what are the the, the the most striking differences between, uh, like when it comes to enterprise architecture, like in terms of trade fi and uh, DeFi. I um, mean, typically I can think about like the the highest level, like the, the use of data, like in data services, oracles, um, and and of course, uh, like in terms of like how you can still have more control on your enterprise architecture within the trade file system, but you really can't have much of that in the, the DeFi system. Yeah, uh, I, I just first glance at that is like, for example, at Block Damien, one of the core products I'm, I'm launching is, is something called permission liquid staking, where mm -hmm. and a lot of it's having a permission state before connecting into DeFi protocols. So we are doing KYC, KYB, AML checks on, uh, automated market makers, liquidity providers, and then creating a liquidity pool uh, from your staking rewards and having a dual token model where, yes, you put in, let's just say you put in 6K or $6 million worth of ETH. And then from there, you have your $6 million pegged, but then every any rewards you get on there, you have rewards that go back to your digital wallet that then you could be able to use in DeFi protocols and, and be able to potentially expand on your rewards or, or you know, do a little playing with that in the liquidity pool. So uh, a lot of it comes mm -hmm. with permissioning and a lot of it comes from actually pegging and actually having collateral based on your assets and your pools or your networks. But um, but yeah, and then oracles help with that. But a lot of times oracles uh, can, uh, can somehow automate processes that are unforeseen to the rest of the group too. Well, I totally agree. And again, um, I mean, it depends on how much auditing has gone on the oracles themselves. <laughs> Because obviously, otherwise, you're depending on the articles and they, they're these automated processes, and then you have no control of that. Um, so, totally agree. So, yeah, I'll reach out to you guys on that. But that's something I think we can also, uh, even from an informational point of view, I think that'd be really helpful if we can add that in here. Perfect. And Mark has his hand up. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Liberati. Yes, th thank you very much. I um <clears throat> and very nice overview. I just wanted to sort of comment because your last slide sort of sparked a, a thought because often I've seen these types of slides where you're they're breaking down the the DeFi players into sort of the different subcategories within the space. But I think what would be very useful in sort of looking at uh, a pro regulatory approach would also be just as you've sort of broken down stable coins into algorithmic and collateralized even within that space there are so many more architectural choices just collateralized you know on chain or off chain uh, verification of the, of that collateral if it's if it's sort of all uh, crypto itself or if you're actually using you know off chain assets and and similar with algorithm there's algorithmic uh, models use different stability mechanisms to try to provide that uh, peg or that reference point so i i think there'd be utility in not getting too technical as you sort of caution against, but also having that sort of taxonomy build so that one can sort of look from a different perspective at the the choices that those companies have made um, in, in providing DeFi services. And then you can also then identify some of the strengths and, and weaknesses to each of those, those models. And I think that would sort of shape and guide the discussions going forward. Thank you, over. 100%. That's highly valuable. And I know there's like, uh, there's this company like two, three years ago created like the token taxonomy framework. It never got like real, real generation amongst enterprises and, and anyone outside of Microsoft because Microsoft tried to launch it. But I think, you know, creating like a DeFi taxonomy framework of stable coins, of yield generating platforms, of, you know, option vaults, or whatever they are, right? We could create tons of those uh, mechanisms that would help us all like think better about this too. Mark, you're, you're done. Your hand. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, anyone else? Well, a couple of things. Um, one is, um, you know as well as I do that this is an open forum, 
open source where other people are there. So normally um, we do not brand our um, presentations, maybe just mention that you're a member of the block team. And, but, you know, if, if every slide- I just took a that, thing that like I had internally anyway. I understand, I understand. As I, understand. I mean, it's a very difficult uh, thing to get uh, around because obviously you have a day job and that, can, that uh, informs what you're doing every day, obviously. Uh, and this was sort of the challenge with um, Zeventus and uh, Marvin with, uh, with the mortgage subgroup as well, uh, because it's often difficult to, you know, switch the hats. Uh, the other, other uh, thing is that we did not just have uh, the dangers of DeFi, we had actually people presenting um, on various aspects, including institutionalization through insurance, for example, creating insurance in, into the DAO um, so that uh, the institutional players are more comfortable uh, in coming into DeFi. This was a pure, um, this was a pure, so-called DeFi, you know, this was uh, the bank, I think it was Bancor network. But, uh, and of course, uh, Mark Richardson who presented it also presented uh, quite at, at length on the uh, way in which uh, some of the AMMs uh, work and also DEX's work. I wonder what the effects of the um, rollout of staking in Ethereum itself will have on this ecosystem. Um, staking is a double-edged sword from as far as I'm concerned, because it gives power to the entrenched people with a lot of uh, coins. So it's basically a plutocratic uh, situation. That means, you know, the more coins you have, the more powerful your voice is. And uh, I know that uh, Vitalik had created a protocol, quadratic uh, voting, which is uh, basically based on uh, suppressing that incredible effect of whales being able to control the protocol. And this is a problem in almost all so-called decentralized protocols because the protocols do favor the people with a lot of coins or a lot of liquidity staked or a lot of governance coins, which uh, causes asymmetric effects. In fact, I have a feeling that some of the Terra stuff that we have seen have uh, something to do with that. So these are, uh, you know, sort of systemic problems with, with the so-called decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, which have to be addressed at some, you know, it, to make it more decentralized, or in my opinion, the use of the word decentralized itself is uh, problematic because in the network theory, distributed trumps decentralized in the original paper that this word is taken from. Decentralized is a way in a evolution towards distributed. Um, but uh, in, the, uh, in our industry, decentralized has taken on uh, value uh, and more than it's uh, meaning implies, <laughs> but anyway, that's besides the point. In terms of the actual uh, mechanics of how we are going to do this, we probably, I mean, I don't know, it's up to you, but start off with a once a month meeting, which does not coincide with ours, uh, or maybe we can even host 
a couple of meetings uh, of the DeFi subgroup inside ours. Uh, now coming back to the um, name, which uh, Sandy had commented on, which is basically that it should be called financial services uh, SIG. Uh, I think that is a, I mean, we, we do concern ourselves with uh, financial services. This is the old, pro, uh, this is the old, uh, I worked in an investment bank for many years and um, there, there was a divide between business and IT. IT was seen as a cost center, as a services sector, not directly contributing to the bottom line. So, you know, the budgeting and so on would take a hit because of that. But in reality, without IT, you cannot run a bank. In fact, some uh, have even suggested that a bank is a technology uh, business with a little reconciliation thrown in <laughs> at the end. But even reconciliation now is based on technology. So in that sense, the name financial services, um, I think would limit us. In fact, I had proposed uh, financial markets and infrastructure, but uh, Karen uh, brought up the point that we should just be called finance special interest group because it encompasses uh, you know, short-term and long-term capital markets, market making, custody, you know, all the other stuff that goes along with it, including payments. And we have had uh, several uh, presentations on CBDCs and such things. Um, and we are supposed to give a <laughs> response to the Fed on CBDCs, but Unfortunately, we could not get it together to, to uh, do that in a structured way because, you know, for a group now, we have also divided between Asia Pacific group and Europe. So the meetings are at different times. So the uh, US EMEA group only meets once in four weeks and the other the APAC group meets once in four weeks on a staggered two weeks schedule. So uh, that's one more thing that has happened. And you know that the Asia Pacific region is very active on this, uh, not only DeFi, but well, Terra is based in Singapore, for example. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of activity in the east, and so there, you know, we we are kind of split into two group, two sections at this moment. But we all collaborate on the wiki, uh, the projects that we have, the labs that we've started. Again, another lab that we started is Neferti, which is uh, meant to be a tooling infrastructure for NFTs. But even that, you know, we are having some trouble getting really off the ground uh, because uh, again, people have real jobs and uh, you know, to do open source work is thankless. Now to come to coming back to TTF uh, that you mentioned, we actually developed uh, eTaller, a CBDC based on uh, TTF. And I'm happy to report that TTF is still alive and well in, inside the Global Blockchain Business Council. They are the ones hosting it now. Microsoft is of course still prominent, but um, other people are coming in there. So the TTF could, uh, because it's a generic framework, could still encompass um, your, uh, uh, what do you call it, DeFi 
taxonomy if you want it, because it can definitely em encompass uh, definitely encompass NFTs. I don't know whether it can encompass. Uh, I, I think it can because I I've looked at the looked at the sort of the building blocks, and they are open to it. It's an open protocol. You can contribute. Uh, and uh, they're still working on, you know, they're focusing now on two other subjects, which is one is the climate change, carbon, uh, you know, or that kind of tokens. And the other one is the net capital markets, which is basically bonds. Uh, and bonds have a great similarity to some of the DeFi protocols, especially with respect to the, um, to the yield and so on, but a yield of 20%, of course, is sort of unsustainable unless inflation itself is 20, 50%. So anyway, uh, so that's, uh, and um, Alfonso just posted that learning tokens is uh, working with GBBC and TTF. Um, that's all I have for um, everything, even though I had promised that I'll do something on the response to the Fed. I am involved with the Open CBDC project and sending them some proposals, but that's in my private capacity. And also the response that I'll be providing to the Fed paper will also be in a private capacity because we were not able to get the thing together. And I encourage all of you to do it because, but the last day is uh, Friday, but these are questions that we have been uh, toss, uh, tussling or uh, having discussions on in this group for a while. Many of the questions, there are 22 questions. You can only respond to just one or two you don't need to respond to 22. Um, so with that, I want to say that, you know, I have said my piece. If Mike has a comment or two, uh, it would be helpful to listen to him. Yeah. Um, I would love to start the some group. I think maybe, you know, uh, a monthly at first uh, could be beneficial. And maybe we have it as like a sub, like, a, you know, within capital markets as it's labeled now, it's just like another tab you click into and we can go into that wiki page and be able to start meeting cadences. And uh, I'll have to just connect with Tomas or and to talk about logistics within Hyperledger or when we would schedule a meeting. I think at first, maybe having it based in uh, America's EMEA friendly hours will be beneficial. Um, potentially moving to night times where we get more of an APAC crowd could be of, of benefit too. But um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm happy to, to help uh, create those administrative steps. And uh, I'll, I'll look to join this biweekly group as much as possible. And, uh, and for Marvin as well, uh, we can coordinate to get a time where I can do a very similar presentation to the mortgage subgroup and seeing where there are similarities. I, I will say most of the interest I get um, professionally and personally is how to get mortgage backed securities into a crypto native pool. Um, so very, a lot of interesting things we could always uh, collaborate on as a group. Yeah, mortgages are a very um, interesting thing because Again, uh, I worked on mortgages for, for maybe 10 years. So I built systems in traditional uh, investment banks, but mostly for risk management and also for trading risk. Uh, in fact, real-time risk, which is a, a tougher thing for mortgages than for anything else. Uh, but to come back to mortgages, they have a characteristic uh, at the bottom layer of NFTs, because each house is a unique thing, 
and the mortgage that attaches to that house is particularly unique. And then uh, pooling those NFTs and then building a bond on top of that based on the underlying cash flows. So the underlying cash flows, this is, this is the key. Underlying cash flows in real world assets can be easily sort of identified. But in DeFi or in some other areas, it's difficult to identify the cash flows, uh, except for the fact that some people are paying uh, huge yields, uh, which is of course a cash flow, but how stable is that cash flow? What, you know, what is the under, what underpins that cash flow? Why is, why is somebody paying you 20%? Is it because they're using that, uh, the new money to pay off that 20%, in which case it's called a Ponzi scheme. It's a very familiar thing to all of us. Uh, but if it's not, if there are some other ways of making money, like staking on Ethereum, staking on something else, but how stable is that payment? You know, these are all matters that uh, that really, you know, in the end determine um, the surety and the stability and whether you're going to have big problems if you invest in something like Luna. I'm not going to tattoo Luna on my arm uh, or nor any other DeFi protocol unless I completely understand it. I heard that Mike uh, Novogratz probably uh, went and got that erased. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it'll be like tattooing the name of your girlfriend and then uh, breaking up. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a it's a tough thing uh, to have to forget something that's etched into your skin. Uh, so, you know, if you have money, uh, like a lot of people have, a lots of money, then you know, five percent, ten percent loss is not a big deal, but if you're putting all your eggs in Luna, then you're probably on the lunatic uh, fringe. <laughs> anyway, enough uh, Luna jokes uh, for today, but that's the joke of the, of the day or the, you know, of the week, I guess. Uh, our aim should be not to have these jokes on an ongoing basis uh, going forward, especially with large amounts of money. Another thing that uh, Mike would be interesting would be like, look at stable coins, for example, how much, uh, what is the uh, TVL in each type of stable coin? People uh, bring up, you know, oh, fiat based, Table coins, then we have commodity based table coins, we have algorithm based table coins. Some of these are theoretical constructs, in my opinion. Of course, uh, something like Luna was, uh, you know, eighth largest or something, but even then, uh, like USDT is. Uh, much bigger than anything else. And now they're bleeding money and people are going into USDC because there seem to be more transparency in the collateral. Uh, yeah, USDT and Tether, it like just morphs any other uh, stable coin out there today. USDC is gaining traction and they, had, they do have a little more transparency um, in their network. But yeah, no, it's, I think it's a very valuable thing to dig into. Well, I mean, I had uh, actually written an article about USDC uh, and criticizing that they are only providing you a monthly audit, whereas month by month growth is like 10, 20% sometimes. 
uh, and what is the point in knowing what what was the audit uh, you know one month ago and that too that is released only 15 days from the end of the month so it's a it's really a month and a half so uh, you know we are so technology based why can't you have at least go look towards real time auditing or real time monitoring uh, instead of uh, some traditional audit company coming up with uh, you know numbers uh, once a month and obviously the usdt we we don't know the only thing we know is the secret sauce the secret sauce is that you've invested in some high yielding product uh, again if the high yielding product price falls then your collateral is worth less than what you bought it at so uh, uh, <laughs> in the end i mean uh, stable coins uh, we we have to look at because stable coins are the basis of uh, of DeFi itself, because if you think about it, without that rail, uh, that digital rail coming in, um, we wouldn't have all these interesting AMMs and DEXs and all those things. And it's it's definitely linked directly to that. Uh, anyway, uh, sorry to ramble on, but I. Uh, think it's a valuable experience to be a valuable experience to listen to you and to participate in this group. And Eugenio is uh, um, going to volunteer, I heard, as the vice chair of this group. Uh, and I welcome Eugenio if he's still interested. Most of it is just administrative work, but, you know, we need those two to get the group uh, sort of set up and going forward. So Mike, I look forward and that's it. Any Thank you, last? appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye. Mike. Thank you, Vipin, for the kind word. Big tune. All right. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you.